Welcome to another episode of Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. On this show, we meet artists transforming lives with their work. Once upon a time, there was a magical place full of beautiful princesses, and they wore the most beautiful gowns you could possibly imagine, with bows and sequins and lace. From their perfectly coiffed hair, to their elegantly manicured hands, down to the tips of their high-heeled shoes, they were the fairest in the land. Handsome princes came from all around to hear these princesses sing and to watch their graceful dancing. This magical land I'm talking about was, of course, Esta Noche. Esta Noche, a Latino gay bar, hosted some of the most memorable drag performances in the San Francisco Bay Area. I first went to Esta Noche as a very young woman. I remember in particular Maricela. Silky black hair, red lips, long fluttering lashes, full of smiles for her throngs of admirers. When I saw Maricela, I thought, she is one of the most beautiful women I have ever seen. That night, as I was leaving Esta Noche, I stopped in the bathroom. I remember looking at myself in the mirror and thinking, I really need to up my game. Many years later, a friend invited me to come to her partner's performance as a drag king. The first thing I thought of was Maricela and Esta Noche. I was really curious to see a performance of masculinity in the same way that I had seen these amazing performances of femininity. When I saw the performance of my next guest, Cassandra Falby, as drag king Brock Cocker, I was not disappointed. Besides being a drag king, Cassandra Falby is also a psychotherapist. I've always imagined that being a psychotherapist would require great powers of observation and a lot of insight. I think these abilities are what served Cassandra so well in creating and performing as a drag king. When I saw Cassandra perform as Brock Cocker, everything about Brock, from the square of his shoulders and the manly strut and a very lush mustache, I mean, Brock was every crazy crush I'd ever had. In her interview, Cassandra talks about how she developed Brock as her drag king alter ego. We also discuss the, hopefully, increased visibility of drag kings within popular culture. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. First up, the art of conversation. You can get more information about this podcast and get in touch with me on the Facebook page, Art Heals All Wounds, and on Twitter and Instagram at Art Heals Podcast. So a week or so ago, I read an interview with Sinead O'Connor, the singer who blazed into pop stardom in the late 80s and early 90s. She's probably most well-known for her version of Nothing Compares to You, a song written by Prince, which was released in 1990. I love that song, but her first album, The Lion and the Cobra, that was released a few years before that, was the soundtrack of my life for most of my senior year in college. My roommate and I literally wore that record out. Some of you probably remember that O'Connor effectively ended her pop career when she tore up a picture of the Pope at the end of a performance on Saturday Night Live. She then became pretty much the fodder of tabloids due to an ongoing struggle with mental health. O'Connor has written a memoir that will be released in the next week or so. Writing this memoir gives her the opportunity to tell her story from her perspective. It also gives us a chance to reevaluate our perception of her and the media's treatment of her. It's really interesting. We absolutely love to put female pop stars way, way up on a pedestal, but what we seem to love even more is to then viciously tear them down. I'm wondering, why do we do this to young women? Obviously misogyny, but more specifically, 
what kind of primitive urge in our society is this practice fulfilling for us? What do you think? I would love if someone out there has any theories or thoughts on this, if you would write to me on Facebook or Instagram and let me know your thoughts. Up next, our deep dive with this episode's guest on Art Heals All Wounds. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Listen and let us inspire you. The other day I was telling a friend that every day in high school, I got up two hours before I had to leave for school. The reason I did was because each morning I showered, shaved my legs and underarms, and washed my hair. Then I blew my hair dry, then I put it up in hot rollers. While the hot rollers were doing their thing, I started it on my makeup. First there was foundation, then blush, then eyeshadow, then eyeliner, then mascara. Then I took the hair down from the hot rollers and sprayed it so that my curls wouldn't immediately melt in the humidity. And then a final blend of the makeup on my face so that it would look as natural as possible. She was laughing hysterically at this. To anyone who does a similar routine every morning, I'm not criticizing you at all. What's funny about me doing this every morning is that it's so unlike me. It's just that Almost every other girl in my high school did the same thing to get ready for school. And I didn't really understand that any of this was in any way optional. My understanding was that that's what you did if you were a girl in this southern town. Actually, that's untrue. What I believed was that that's what you did if you were a girl. This was just one of the things on my mind during my conversation with my next guest, Cassandra Falby. Cassandra has performed as drag king Brock Cocker for over 10 years now. This experience of performing masculinity and creating a character who has a lot of flexibility on the gender spectrum has helped her to expand her own comfort zone in the expression of her gender. Hi, Cassandra. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Art Heals All Wounds. Can you start off just by telling us a little bit about yourself? We're going to talk about your drag king persona and your performance in that way, but there's a lot more about you. Sure, Pam, and thank you so much for having me. So I uh, am a drag king, um, semi-retired, I might say, (laughs) and uh, my drag king's name is Brock Cocker. I have not... um, I have not really um, been able to, definitely since the pandemic and a little before, uh, Brock has not been out and about, but Mm. Brock does always live within me. Uh, In addition to uh, being a drag king and doing performance in that that way, I am also a psychotherapist and I have a private practice in Oakland, California. Um, And also a little sidebar as well. I've been known to do comedy, stand-up comedy. So those are some of the domains that I inhabit. And uh, and they bring me joy. I have a good, I enjoy doing them. Well, so first of all, I'm really sad to hear that Brock is semi-retired. I, I hope that the, the emphasis is on semi. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us the story. How did you decide to start performing as a drag king, and where did this persona of Brock Cocker come from? I firmly believe that uh, I was destined to be a theater kid, but never truly realized that, uh, that part of me. And uh, I did, you know, performance, did piano, violin, those types of things, but nothing in the, in the way of, of performing on stage or performing in front of people, uh, acting things out you know, things like that, things like that. Yeah. So, um, for me, Brock, actually, I was, I had another persona before Brock, very short lived. And, uh, and he was born in, um, in San Francisco and his name was Gus D. Windy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, 
just be with that. And then I, I wanted to have Gus was someone who was, uh, this, he was a straight guy about town. He was from the Midwest. Brock is also from the Midwest. So, so Gusty Windy was, uh, from like the Chicago area. So Ah. he was a Midwestern, but there was something about it that I, I didn't feel like I could fully, Gus didn't fully realize all the things that I wanted a character to be. So I created Brock and Brock is, uh, was more fun loving than Gus, more, um, more of a people person. I am, I think I lean more at times toward being slightly introverted. So, uh, Brock is not that person. Brock loves people, loves, loves, loves animals, loves life. He's very much that person. Um, Brock is, uh, pansexual. Brock is just, Brock is all things all the time. He's, he's, he's a a people magnet. So (laughs) I think in some ways, you know, I think with characters that people develop, the character in some ways is a part of what that person wants to be or hasn't just wants to kind of be that partially there's a part of them so i think that there's definitely some overlap between um uh brock and i but brock is definitely braver than i am brock has a little more courage than i do wow so that's fascinating and but this still doesn't really um i mean there might be a lot of different ways to perform and so what had you seen about drag kings? What was it that attracted you to performing as a drag king? I really liked this idea of of playing with gender. And I had always been, I think for me, it was an extension in some ways of um, ways that I had played with gender earlier in in my uh, life, even into childhood, ways that I occupied gender. And, you know, back when I was, you know, a a kid, there, things were much more rigid, way more rigid than they are now in terms of things that boys could do and girls could do. And, um, and I really felt, I really felt constricted and restrained by what some of those limitations uh, were at that time. And, and I think in some ways, I I really like the idea of being able to be a little more free, a little more expansive with gender in ways that felt comfortable to me in ways that uh, perhaps I might not be able to, to try something out and see if it fit for me. And, um, and finding that the more I tried it on, and the more I even I tried the costumes on figurative, figuratively and literally, they were all quite comfortable. So what sort of things felt comfortable to you when you were um, trying on Brock's costume? Well, for sure, I I was able to I, I was able to play some play a little more. It gave me a space to kind of try out different ties, different types of shirts and so forth and and really. I, you know, where Brock and I overlap is that Brock is still feminine. Brock has those elements. So, uh, Brock loves a good, like, you know, you know, dangly earring. Brock loves a a nice, um, a nice scarf. Brock loves glitter, sequins, sparkles. I mean, this is all part of the way to be, to, have to play. And I think that Brock tries to maximize joy. I think that those are things that bring Brock joy. And also those are things that bring me joy. And I, I think I, you know, as part of, you know, my process and also his development and his kind of grow, growing up, you know, kind of his growth is that um, there are definitely ways that there could be a a drag king didn't have to be masculine. And I think once I got to a place where I discovered that, then I was all in, I was like, well, you know, Brock has like Brock, Brock doesn't wear them now because Brock's, you know, 
has 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 uh, certain limitations, but Brock has a delightful pair of um, silver glitter, like six inch heels that Brock used to wear. Right. Like, so those are the things that I think um, felt very freeing. So um, there was more space and more room to kind of create different narratives and that that Brock and both Brock and I can find joy in the development of those narratives. I've seen you perform twice as Brock and the performances were very different. The first performance would, I would say, followed along what you were describing as sort of this softer side of Brock. But the second time was what I think of in my head is almost like a semi striptease that Brock did where Brock was wearing the, I think there were jeans with chaps or was it just jeans? You are correct. Jeans they with were, chaps? They were, they were, uh, they were, they were jeans that had a little flourish down the side. Yes. Yeah. Well, they yeah. had, I think snaps, right? They, d- they did. You have okay. a good memory, Pam. You have a good I'll, memory. Well, yeah. I'll never forget this because it was one of the best <laughs> things I've ever seen. Um, at the end of, you know, this one, Brock was very masculine in this particular performance. He was dressed as a cowboy. And what was interesting is that when I watched that one especially, I almost forgot about you, Cassandra, because Brock was so fully this person who he was kind of strutting in this very flirtatious and masculine way. And I almost feel like you were wearing or that Brock was wearing cowboy boots. Is that true? There, I, I, yes, I think, yeah, I just think back, but yeah, yeah. And at the end of the thing, he like yanks these jeans with snaps off and he's wearing tidy whities underneath <laughs> is my memory. Maybe I've embellished it in my <laughs> But everything about the walk, the glances, everything was this very flirtatious male stripper in a way. And very kind of that, again, if we're talking about performance, this really performance of machismo that was really, it was very adorable. He was like a very sexy man in that particular one. So Brock did have many different sides to him. And as I said, I'll never forget it because it was just so good. It was so surprising and so both funny and endearing. And I absolutely had a crush on Brock after that, so... That's another reason why I'm sad that he is semi-retired. <laughs> <laughs> so how did yeah. you, I'm really curious to know, how do you come up with what these performances and like this idea of like, okay, well, I'm going to perform as Brock Cocker. So what is this going to be about? How do you think mm-hmm. of those things? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, well, thank you for, for, that was a nice walk down memory lane. That was good. Um, (laughs) I just, I'm I'm kind of chuckling at that. Yeah. So, you know, I kind of look at, uh, kind of how I would frame out or used to frame out performance, um, sometimes is with three, well, drag performance with three kind of components. I mean, there are many components, but I kind of see it as um, kind of a triangle. And one part is, you know, if it's kind of standard drag, you're performing to a song. One part is music. One part is your costume or your outfit. And then the other part uh, is your choreography. So kind of thinking about those three uh, sides of a triangle, if, if you will. And, so there can be a one one part that motivates. So it can be like, oh, I have this 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 particular choreography that I think would be interesting to do, and to see what other pieces, what are the other two pieces that that um, that mesh nicely with that. And in this case, with this particular piece. Uh, it was a song. It was a song. So I'm a a, a Billy Ocean fan. It was Billy Ocean. And, um, and that particular song, I thought it would be interesting. It's, I, it's a song that I was listening to a lot at that time. And I thought, what would it, what would, it would be really interesting for Brock to kind of do this and actually be 
a cowboy, but like how, what would that be? And what would that look like? And, and, you know, like what would he be doing and, um, and so forth. So I kind of, that was something that came out of a song, right? So it's from the song, then it's kind of thinking about what would the costume be? And it's like, okay, we're going to do cowboy. So we have those two components. And then what would the choreography be? So it's bringing those three parts together. And generally that's, that's how I think about, um, performance, but there's usually one piece, one of those three that takes the lead and then it forms the other, other two. Brock just sort of owned that crowd. And this is going to sound, um, odd, perhaps not, but what Brock was doing, that is not me. Right. Like, so there's a way where there's almost, when we talk, um, about kind of uh, this idea to in uh, therapy too as depersonalization. So there's a way where that when I think back, you know, way back to that time, I think about how that was, it's, it's a part of me, but then there's a way that I'm both inhabiting it and it's, 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 I'm stepping away from it, which is this interesting mix. And I think it's, it's shifting, like it's constantly you know, I'm constantly moving between those two, those two spaces. And, um, and I also think that there's something about, you know, even just with general clothing removal, even just a piece that people, people, res- people respond to that. Right. Like, so it could just be, you know, depending on your crowd, it could be taken off a, a sock or you see people who maybe are removing a garter, right? Like people go, you know, it's, it's, it really plays with um, something that people like, which is anticipation and wow. anticipation playing, playing that game, you know, that's the it, anticipation is something that, that leaves people in a place where it's like, Ooh, what's next? What are we doing? What's next? <laughs> what's next? Where are we going? Show me, show me. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think that, you know, thinking back to, um, also the costume that Brock was wearing, I think, um, it's, you know, again, it's something that I, you would never see me, Cassandra. It's not something I would wear. No, I've never seen you wear anything. You've never seen, it. right. Like <laughs> ever, ever, ever. But there's a way that when Brock puts that on, regardless of what the costume is, the outfit, the clothing, the material, that he's just going to make it work. He's bold in that way. And like I said, I, I find that he um, is another, um, he's courageous in ways that I think at times I wish I could be. Hmm. But that's so interesting because it seems like if you've had this experience that you're describing where you can kind of, you're both there present, but you also step away and you allow this other thing to come through, it seems like you could kind of take that into other aspects of your life. I appreciate that uh, question, Pam. It's it's interesting because it, it seems that it would just flow, right? There's the, It seems, but there's almost like a, a, a transition, a kind of moving into, it's, it's like a mindset. So even for, you know, even as Brock is, you know, if I'm going to be, you know, thinking back to you know, performing as Brock's preparing to kind of go on. It's there's, there's actually like a shifting. It's, it's almost like a superhero, but shift (laughs) there's, but there's this shift that happens where I am almost less myself and more him, right? There's a way that I become, you know, as I, it gets closer to what I'm performing, I become less myself, not in a bad way. It's just kind of like, Oh, 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 Brock, Brock's going to need this body to do what he needs to do. Okay, go ahead. I was, I'm, I'm patient. I'm patient. So it's all good. And it's all in, you know, expression of joy or just expression of a feeling. Sometimes it, ha- it hasn't always been joy, um, but most of the time it has been. And it's allowing for this even deeper uh, expression of feeling, of a message, of a certain um, uh, internal experience that Brock wants to, to show. Brock wants to offer that and welcome people into his world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
And then I want to go back to one other thing you talked about, which I thought was really interesting, which is that um, being Brock allows you to explore some things about gender that you maybe didn't get to explore as a child. You mentioned that it was very strict in those days. Did you ever feel like, oh, I really want to do this particular masculine thing as a kid and you weren't allowed to? I've been thinking about this a lot, actually, you know, kind of thinking about these different, you know, childhood and adolescence and and young adulthood and, and how these phases, how they were punctuated by by gender. Mm -hmm. And I definitely have multiple times that I can remember as um, as a child where the message I got was that, oh, girls don't do that. Like I was like, I know you got me, you know, I know I'm like four and you got me this like little bikini, you know, this little bikini thing. But what I'm going to let you know is I'm not wearing this top. I'm just trying to be like, like him. That's what I'm trying to do. Right. Like, yes. Right. Like that's what I'm trying to do or even how, um, I might want to sit and how I want to be. And I mean, even, you know, I, I have, I definitely got, I remember one time I got reprimanded for not sitting in a way that was becoming of a lady. Yeah. So I couldn't, I, I, and that's something that I was thinking about recently, but what I love and one of the things that, um, I feel I have more access to is, is Brock's existence has allowed me to feel more expansive in my own gender, gender presentation, like all sorts of things that feel comfortable to me. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and in terms of identity and what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be uh, a man, masculine, feminine? Um, you know, those, those types of things. And, you know, has even had, you know, really has me more in a non-binary that's, you know, kind of being, um, identifying more as non-binary as I'm, you know, kind of looking at what feels right to me and kind of, you know, sometimes I feel, you know, more feminine and I'm, you know, I'm fem identified. So that part is, is, is pretty static for me. My fem identity is, but how I, um, you know, kind of how I am in the world, how I present that can have a, a fluidity that doesn't, um, that doesn't kind of disturb that feminist for me. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, and, and for me, my feminine is, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty rooted. What, what the process and what Brock's presence has done is it's just kind of, uh, created more space for there to be kind of more joy, more magic, more like just teasing things apart. Um, Sometimes more fun because, like I told you, he loves it. You know, Brock loves a good time. Um, <laughs> and I think the fun, you know, the kind of the fun nature, you know, he identifies as a butch queen. So that's kind of how, where he inhabits, um, you know, that's kind of how he is. And that's that's his his being and his uh, his identity. So, Cassandra, one thing that I wonder about is that. I've heard of drag queens much more than I've heard of drag kings. And I think a lot of people would say the same thing. Why is that? Well, I don't know for sure, of course, but I, I have my thoughts. I think there are a variety of things that, you know, that impact uh, why drag queens are more prevalent than drag kings. Um, I think they're, I think they're, it's multi-layered. You know, I think that it has to do with, um, on a certain level, it has to do with misogyny. I think that it has to do with uh, a fear of the feminine or just kind of the value of the feminine. Um, I think it also depends on who has access to media. I think that's, that's a part of it as well. Um, I think there's also some part of um, it that has to do with um, 
how free people feel to access specific uh, uh, ways of kind of performing or doing gender. I think those are some of the, the things that come into play. When you say misogyny, misogyny by who? Because what's so interesting about drag is that you have men performing as women and women performing as men, and then some non-binary people also in there. Is it misogyny on the part of male performers? Is it the larger context of misogyny in our culture? Mm -hmm. What exactly is the misogyny that you're talking about? I'm really talking about, I mean, I think there are different ways you can go, obviously, with that question. But I think for this for the sake of our conversation today, I'm focusing on kind of more uh, cultural misogyny for individuals who want to, uh, regardless of gender, want to perform uh, or engage with femininity. It's seen as, as I think, um, I'll speak in broad brush terms. It's, it's you know, historically these things have seen, seen um, are seen as less valuable. So we're talking about, you know, oftentimes women's labor, things that women do, they don't necessarily have as much value. And I think there, for some people, there may be questions about, well, let's say, um, uh, you know, talking about drag queens, if you decide to do heels, like some people think that heels are ridiculous. And some people extrapolate that, well, uh, one, you know, heels are ridiculous, but also women are ridiculous. I think that what drag queens do is they actually um, highlight some of the fun and the joy that can be part of these things and, um, and kind of shine a light on it in a different way, I think. And there's some people who really appreciate that and love that and value it and, and want to join in, in the, in the joy, want to be a part of the fun. Um, and then there are also folks, you know, historically who just don't understand why you'd want, why would you want to, uh, wear a dress, wear earrings, wear jewelry. These things don't make sense. And I'm talking specifically in a Western context. So focusing on that. Um, but, but really kind of why would you want to adorn your body in this way? You know, um, why do you see value in these things that are inherently, you know, they don't have value. If we kind of go down to the basics, where a, a, a man wearing a dress versus women wearing pants. You think if we just go out into the world, talk about Western culture, how often do you see one of those and how often do you see the other? And, and when men are doing drag, when they're drag queens, there is, uh, they're not doing that in a way where there's shame because you know historically there's been shame attached to these things. Um, there's been, you know, vilification for, for wearing women's clothing and what that means and, um, people beaten, harmed, arrested, killed for these things. And so I think that there's the weight of that. And, and I think, you know, and to some degree it's, you know, for drag Kings, you know, it might just be seen as like, Oh, Oh, look, dressing up like, like men. Isn't that, isn't that nice? isn't that, isn't that sweet? Isn't that cute? I think there's, there can be almost a, um, a kind of a, a demutization of, of, of that. And I think what drag Kings try to do is show that there is variation, that there are different ways of performing, that there is joy, that there can be fun and also performing what their experience of either masculinity is because not all drag kings are masculine like brock's not necessarily the most masculine person but he is a drag king right 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 so it's it's also getting in there and playing with with gender as well um but i think um i think those are some of the factors and i think it also is um who has access to the resources to um create spaces where these things occur and also where the interest is in that, like who's interested in, in doing those types of things. I mean, I love, personally, I love seeing drag Kings perform in the variation and I'm always excited about some of the new folks. Um, like there's, um, 
um, out of uh, Southern California, there's Landon Sider, who um, has, is really fantastic. Over in the UK, there's Adam All. Adam All's fantastic. I mean, there's some really great, um, there's some really great folks. There are other folks as well um, that I um, uh, haven't named. There's just a ton of folks. Um, and I think that there's, there's a new way of doing drag that um, uh, is demonstrating that, the, that it's not a two-dimensional way of performing, that they're just, that there can be fun and playfulness in, in drag and being a drag king. Yeah. One thing that appeals to me about drag kings is that in this performance of masculinity, there's such a wide range and there are so many things that you can celebrate and enjoy within this context of performance that maybe in your relationship or in your workplace or something would not be something that you would celebrate. Like you can really see a performance of machismo that's very, very fun to watch as a performance, whereas you might not experience it as fun in your daily life. There was recently this article in the New York Times that said sort of like, keep an eye on these drag kings. Do you feel like it might become more well known? Well, I, you know, that's my hope. My hope is that it's an upward trajectory. I also wanted to respond to something that you just said related to kind of uh, real life versus drag, um, and both are kind of performances, right, of masculinity, that with drag, the same way with, um, with drag queens, there's often, like the playfulness that I talked about, there's often kind of like a, um, with drag kings, it's poking holes in masculinity. Mm. So in some ways, like that, that's different than real life, because it's showing up as this thing that is, um, is more, perhaps more rigid, it's not flexible, whereas there's a way that with performance, when you add the creativity into that, that it is, that it's, that it's machismo, but it's, it's, you know, oftentimes it's, it's play with that. It's, and it's kind of, kind of, um, a way to engage with it differently than, um, than perhaps it's meaning in the outside world and the lived world where there are all of these other things that are, I mean, it's, in, it's, it's theater in a way, but there's so much more riding on it out in the real world. Right. That is yeah. a really great point. But that is coming back to your character, Brock Cocker. Mm -hmm. That's part of what I really love about him is that you said he's not the most masculine person, but at times he does take on some of the more machismo things and you're able to blend this portrait of someone where you're playing with both sides, a more feminine side of the spectrum and a more masculine side. And I really like that combination in him, in his character. Yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of, it, it allows for more of, rather than it being, right, we talk about gender binaries, it allows for this spectrum, this flexibility. And I think that um, while there's some people that are, a fl that, that, need to need the binary to exist, need gender binaries to exist, to feel, to feel whole. There are folks where the, just by the gender binary existing, people feel limited. They don't feel whole. They don't feel like they can be themselves. They feel that they're, they have only uh, partial access to who they want to be, whether that's a character or people just in real, right. In real time, in real life, lived experiences. So, um, it is so layered because of our culture, because of the nature of the performance, there's a lot to sort of sort through and think about. And just the yeah, other, that, that how different the histories are and, and how they're first, you know, for so long, historically, there have been dedicated spaces for drag queens to perform. And, and a lot of that is about creating safety for chosen families, safety for being, being able to be yourself. And, um, and I mean, I would say again, with misogyny, I would say that, that maleness or masculinity doesn't necessarily, um, there's no, you know, they say like, there's no crying in baseball. There's no playing with masculinity. You cannot play with that. 
it is in some ways it sits as this thing that needs to be almost untouchable. And I think that um, it doesn't allow for that flexibility for that, that way of being. And I think that um, having spaces for drag queens to perform um, has allowed for that flexibility mm -hmm. for that to become something that's a culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is a drag, there is a drag king culture as well, for sure. There's definitely that. And, um, but I think that, um, I think, I think people perhaps still are kind of fascinated on what does it mean when a man is wearing a dress? There's still something that's kind of taboo and scandalized, mm -hmm. you know, scandalous about that for some mm -hmm. folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. Again, though, I am fully behind the increased popularity of drag kings because there's so much creativity out there and everything from the look to the, you know, what kind of their persona is going to wear, what the hairstyle is going to be, is there going to be like added facial hair components, and then just the bearing and the attitude. It is such a wonderful way to think about masculinity within our culture. And it is a really fun thing to go and watch something that, especially for myself, that maybe I have some ambivalence about. Maybe I don't want a machismo boyfriend, but I do find that style very sexy. You can go see a very macho drag king and just fully enjoy it. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that what you're saying is that there are these different ways about us as individuals where there are these, uh, where we kind of, we may not necessarily know why or may not necessarily know, but we know how we feel about it. And we know that we're interested in it. And maybe we haven't necessarily uh, figured out the the motivation, but, you know, it's, it's, it's being, um, being interested in both things, being interested in a blend. But yeah, I, I think, you know, it's wonderful to see, you know, the current drag Kings, the ones that I have seen. Um, I love the, the, the kind of, um, you know, exuberance that some of them have related to use of color, related to hair, related to costuming. And really it's the, it's, it's, um, I love the attention to detail. Um, you know, I mean, if you can get like a, a blazer or a vest or a, some type of flourish around the neck that has some sequins, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. <laughs> yes, definitely. If we want to find out when Brock might be performing again, how could people do that? So... Uh, Brock has actually a Facebook page. Go figure. Um, <laughs> yeah, Brock has a Facebook page. Uh, you can learn a little bit about him there. And uh, yeah, anything, um, any performances would be would be listed on that page. It's It's been a minute, but you could even use it as an archive. There we go. To learn okay. About him. okay. Well, thank you so much. And we do hope that Brock considers coming out of retirement once once it's safe to perform and gather and enjoy his <laughs> dance moves. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I will likely, I'll, I'll say this, Pam, I will likely be seeing him sometime soon, probably today. Ah. And yeah, I'll likely see him today sometime. Please uh, tell him. I miss him. I, w I certainly will do that. I'll let him know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll, I'll let him know that um, that you'd be excited to see him return when it's safe to do so. I'll pass that message on to him. I would. I would. <laughs> You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Remember to be in touch on my Facebook page, Art Heals All Wounds, and also on Twitter and Instagram at Art Heals Podcast. Thank you so much to Cassandra Falby for joining me on this episode and talking about her performance as drag king Brock Cocker. 
If you want to learn more about Brock Cocker, you can find him on Facebook. That's B R O C K, new word C O C K E R. And please, if you do look him up on Facebook, urge him to come out of retirement. The music you've heard in this podcast is Yellow Light District and Otto Waschenlage Instrumental by Lobo Loco. Beethoven's Piano Sonata No. 15 in D Major was performed by Karina Galanian. <laughs>